I wasn't so aware of the royalty checks because I think my mom was intercepting them. She told me later that I earned enough from APX royalties to put me through a year of MIT. And I, I came out with wearing a white robe and wearing a very tall plastic garbage bag on my head. But the kids loved it. This is Antic, the Atari 8-Bit Podcast. I'm Kevin Savitz. Joel Gluck published four programs through Atari Program Exchange. Babel, A Tank, Pushover, and Funforth. The first, Babel, was published when he was just 16 years old. He later worked at Atari Corporate Research under Alan Kay. He also wrote a few articles for Analog Computing Magazine. Babel was available in the first APX catalog, Fall 1981, where it won second prize in the entertainment category. Pushover first appeared in the Summer 1982 catalog, and A Tank first appeared in the Winter 1982-1983 catalog. Funforth was first available in the Fall 1982 catalog, where it won third prize in the System Software category. This interview took place on November 20th, 2015. In it, we discuss Jack Palovich, whose interview has already been published. So in our pre-interview chat, you said that no one has ever asked you about this time in your life, and I find that hard to believe, and it makes me sad. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh-huh. Yeah, it, well, it, right. It's it's probably not completely true, but it, it's not something that comes up a lot. Um, uh, back in 2007, when I uh, I actually met my wife in Thailand in 2006, so she when she visited me in the U.S. for the first time, she saw this little clipping, this little article that I had in a little frame on my wall that was me being interviewed by a local newspaper when I was a kid that said, you know, what do you want to do in your future? And it had a quote from me saying, I want to, to, be, to start my own computer company. Hmm. So, and she thought that was really interesting because when I met her, I was not in computers at all. So I admitted to her that when I was a kid, I was you know, basically this self-taught computer programmer writing video games and educational software for Atari uh, and, and doing all this stuff that I don't do now. And she got really curious about that because she's an occupational therapist and she was head of a clinic in in Bangkok in Thailand. So she asked me if I could help create a video game for her clinic. So something for special needs kids to practice their, their, their motor skills and perceptual skills. So she and I in 2007 when I was living in Thailand, we, we actually created a game together. We programmed a game together. Uh, that we installed at her clinic and, and was used by the kids there. So uh, after many, many years, she kind of recovered my uh, interest and skills in programming and, and video game writing and kind of brought that back. Oh, nice. So are you still dabbling in that now? Well, I, what I did was that year when, I, when she asked me if I could do that, I needed to find a programming language because mm-hmm. we're talking 2000, 2007, so I was no longer programming in BASIC. Uh, so I ended up just doing a, a web search for the different qualities I wanted in a computer language and up popped this language I'd never heard of before called Python. Mm-hmm. So I basically learned Python and ended up becoming a Python programmer. And uh, after that project with her, uh, I got a request from someone locally here in Boston to create some interactive stuff for their training, communications training website. And I ended up writing a mock-up for that in Python. So basically, I ended up, uh, as a kind of sideline, becoming a web programmer using Python and a web framework called Django, which is a Python web framework. (laughs) So I still do a little bit of that today but it's it's a sideline my main work is leadership training and executive coaching i'm also a therapist so i do these kind of very right-brained things that are very much about communication skills and human relationships but then my old love of programming has kind of come back as a sideline in my life oh that's awesome and you're you're uh, in the boston area is that right yeah i live in cambridge currently we're about to move to belmont well, you started off by mentioning that uh, your wife had seen a little article about you in, in the local newspaper, and there was an article about you in the fall 
1981 edition of uh, Atari Connection magazine. Um, there's a big old picture of you sitting in front of your Atari 400, and after you had had some stuff published by uh, Atari Program Exchange, that must have been weird. Was it was that- very weird. Yeah, I was I was suddenly getting a lot of publicity in my life. That 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 Atari Program Exchange thing was not even the biggest publicity I got. I, I actually, People Magazine contacted me because they were doing an article on Video Whiz Kids, and they had, I, I, was, I was starting as an undergrad at MIT, so they had a couple of photographers take me for a drive out to a place where there was an actual tank, like a World War II era tank, uh-huh. and they had me sit up on top of a tank and took photos of me wearing a leather helmet and that appeared as a full-page photo in People magazine, uh, probably in 1982 or the beginning of 1983. Wow! Uh, it was an article on Video Whiz Kids, and they had a bunch of different young programmers like me in that article. Huh. So that was kind of extraordinary. And then a year or so later, uh, when I was uh, at Atari Corporate Research with Jack Palovich. Mm-hmm. I was actually living... Do you know who Jack Palovich is? Yes, I know the name. Yeah, so he wrote Deep Blue Sea and he he created the original gauntlet for the Atari computer, which ended up being basically adapted for coin-op. So he went to work for Atari and he invited me to come out for a summer. And so I was was staying with him and his uh, roommate Landon Dyer, who was also, I think, working for Atari... And uh, Jack and I were asked to come down to Los Angeles to be shot by a very famous photographer, and uh, we appeared in Geo magazine. So that was also a big piece of publicity. So for for a young person, I was kind of having my 15 minutes of fame very very early (laughs) on. Uh, It was very weird. Uh, I was also flown around to the Atari computer camps to give talks to kids. Yeah, to young kids. And you're a young really kid. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, but I, you know, I was a little older than them, right? So I was you're like right. 16 or something or 17, and uh, or or maybe I don't, I don't know how old I was at the time. And you know, I was speaking to groups of say 12 year olds or 13 year olds or 14. So I was a little bit older. Yeah. What, and what did your parents think of all this? Uh, you know, my parents were surprisingly open and encouraging. Uh, like. When I, I mean, this all started when my math teacher, who was the chairman of the math department of my junior high school, a guy named Joseph Tartikoff, he's uh, related to the... Yeah, to to Brandon? He's related to the famous Brandon Tartikoff, yes, the TV guy. Yeah. So so Joseph Tartikoff, uh, uh, I was this very avid math student. And I was hanging around the math office playing with, you know, what abacuses and slide rules. So he hands me this book on basic programming. This must have been when I was in seventh or eighth grade. I took it home. I wrote a computer program on paper and handed it back to him. (laughs) He, unbeknownst to me, took it to the local high school and had them run it on the mainframe and brought me the printout which, of course, was filled with errors because I'd never written a computer program before. <laughs> but that really got the bug going for me, and I ended up bicycling over, bicycling over to Radio Shack uh, like every day or every week to play with the TRS-80. And I kept reading about different computers in magazines, the Commodore Pet and the Bally computer. There were all these new home computers that were happening at that time. So my parents actually let me spend money that I'd saved over time on a Commodore PET. That was my first computer. It was the 8K monochrome chiclet keyboard, mm-hmm. cassette, built-in cassette tape recorder. The early one. Yeah. Very early one. And I just spent all my time programming that thing and writing games and, and other stuff on there. I, I even, I think, brought it into school to demonstrate things. And I wrote a program and took it to the Long Island Math Fair and um, won a silver medal at the Long Island Math Fair uh, for, for a math quiz program that I wrote. Hmm. The kid who won the gold medal, he'd written an astronomy program, lived on my hall at MIT. We were both living in East Campus. So, you know, a few years later, I saw that kid again. Uh, and um, and it was then a few years after that, uh, the Atari computers came out, and basically I, I got an Atari 400. That was my first co- color computer. 
So moving from a Commodore PET to an Atari 400 was, was amazing because of all the things the Atari could do with sound and with graphics. I was in, I was in total heaven uh, having an Atari. Right, I bet. And so you already knew some basics, so you just kind of had to learn the Atari version of the language and, and uh, dove right in, I assume. Exactly. And, you know, I was, I was completely... It was like a drug, you know. I could just spend all my time, <laughs> at, and and you know, hours would just disappear. Uh, you know, I could spend an entire day uh, into the night. You know, my parents have to like tear me away from the keyboard. Uh, any excuse I could have to write a program, like if it was a birthday or Mother's Day, I would be writing an animated birthday or Mother's Day card <laughs> on the computer. You know, so, so there's anything I could do to be using it for things I would do. To uh, you know, to you know, even to the distraction. Uh, you know, schoolwork was just like a distraction in the face of that. Sure. So yeah. What I what I realized later when I got into MIT was that I'm not particularly adept at advanced math or science. Mm-hmm. But I what I loved about programming, aside from sort of the logic of it and the design of it, was really it was an incredible artistic palette. So here I was doing wild experiments with graphics, with colors, with you know geometric designs, with um, with animation, you know, million things. It was really a multimedia art form mm-hmm. for me, and I, I I wrote many, many, many countless small experimental programs, and then a few bigger uh, real games or applications. So I'm curious about. We're going to talk about each of your APX programs and uh, yeah. and and other things you did too but we'll start with the APX programs and I'm curious about um, Babel Babel pronounced right pronounced Babel I tend I tend to pronounce it Babel but you can pronounce okay. it however you want okay yeah. so Babel um, I'm curious about that because it's so early it's uh, it was a 38th program published <laughs> by APX <laughs> which is uh, kind of unusual because many of the early programs were written by people who worked at Atari, and they were just kind of. It seemed like they were looking around for people at people for people they knew for, you know, hey, do you have something we can publish at APX? You know, it's a lot of stuff written by Atari insiders and stuff. So relatively early, you're out of the gate with, with uh, the, as a 16 year old as as a publisher of Babel. So I'm wondering how you found out about them, how you got published, how you, how you got there so early. That is an excellent question. I think I had been very eager to publish something, and I, I had been in contact with Creative Computing, the magazine. Sure. And I might have even published or tried to publish something through Creative Computing. I don't know if it was a Commodore PET program or an Atari program, but already I was eager to, to publish something. And I'm, I'm wondering, with the Atari 400, whether somehow in the box or does one send away for the magazine or was there information on Atari Program Exchange? There must have been some information about how to publish one's programs that, that either came with the computer mm-hmm. or... Probably. So, yeah, so, so probably I was very eager at that time to show someone what I could do and I came up with this idea for a program. I, that that game is probably the one I'm most proud of, even though it has probably the most primitive graphics, <laughs> because it's a um, it's a nonviolent game. You're you're building towers to reach the stars in Babel, mm-hmm. and if you try to go too fast to reach the stars, you fall down and lose points. But if you build your towers carefully, you can actually build them and climb up them and touch stars and get points that way. <laughs> So it's a it's kind of a neat concept. It it could be re-implemented someday by someone with like decent graphics and because it's it's kind of a fun idea. It is. So did you, as far as you remember, just come up with this this idea yourself, or was it inspired by something? Came up with it myself. Nice. Yeah, my my dad was always sort of amazed that I was just down in the <laughs> basement doing all this myself. So he would he would help me. Like we would sit in the kitchen talking about documentation, and he would help me. Kind of, uh, I, I think APX had some kind of format for documentation they like. So he he and I would kind of sit down and ta- and be writing and talking about how to write the documentation. But when it came to the design and programming, that was all me. And I don't know where I was getting this stuff. I mean, partially I was being inspired, I'm sure, by arcade games that I had seen. Sure. Yeah. 
let me start the program and it says uh, return now to those ancient days when people tried to reach the heavens yes exactly <laughs> that's nice very poetic I like it yeah and then that's a company I don't know if you can hear the sound when you run it but it's accompanied by this music bum 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 this very dramatic biblical sounding music like uh, you know like Ten Commandments sort of uh, have you seen the movie The Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston yeah, long time. Like, I was going for that kind of very awe inspiring you know very significant sounding thing which is hilarious because what you're really doing is piloting a pixel with your joystick. So it's really like, you know, if anything is less awe-inspiring than, pi- than piloting a little square pixel around the screen, it's hilarious. <laughs> nice. Had you started getting royalty checks on that before you, you submitted the next one, which was a tank? Probably, yeah. I mean, what what started to happen was I was getting royalty checks and uh, I I wasn't so aware of the royalty checks because I think my mom was intercepting them. Hmm. She told me later that I earned enough from APX royalties to put me through a year of MIT. Wow. So it was, was, you know, pretty good money. Uh, So I never really saw that money. That money went right into college (laughs) for me. But what I did get from APX by, I, I guess I won an, a, a, an award or two, uh, an Atari, Atari Star Award or whatever they call it. So I started to get prizes from them. So the UPS truck would pull up and I would get a disk drive or I would get an Atari 800 or I'd get a printer. Uh, and that was amazing to me that I was getting the, these free products from Atari, basically. It was blowing my mind. So so the UPS truck became this incredible thing for me where I would be like, I would be in the kitchen, you know, having a cookie and then hear a sound of a truck pulling up and be running out the front door and there'd be a box for me. It's very exciting. So I have, I have very fond associations with UPS trucks. <laughs> it's like the Wells Fargo wagon is a coming. Yes, exactly. <laughs> nice. That's cool. Did they tell you that we're sending you a, a, a disk drive or was it just... I, I think the way surprise. that it worked is yeah I think the way that it worked is you get to, you got to choose what you wanted mm. so I probably chose stuff uh, I think that's the way that it worked I I really don't remember how their prizes worked the prize was a year at uh, MIT apparently mm. <laughs> um, let's see and and next up so is there anything we want to say about a tank you're driving tanks around and uh, shooting at each other and. <laughs> Yeah, I, I guess I'd say uh, that's probably my most fully realized game. I mean, of the three games that I submitted to APX, there, there was a fourth project, which was uh, Fun Fourth, which was not a game, but, but just like a, a set of tools for the fourth language. Um, but I would say that A Tank was probably, of the games, was the most developed game. Uh, it, it had some great features. It could be a lot of fun to play if two players were fairly evenly matched. Uh, and it it had the coolest graphics. I really went to town with char- character graphics. Uh, so you know these tanks could spin around. You each player had two tanks on the screen. So the one that had a dot on its back, you were controlling when you held the red button down on your joystick. The one without the dot, you were controlling when you let the button go. So you could switch control between the two tanks. When you turn the joystick right or left, your tank spins. When you push it forward, your tank goes forward in whatever direction it's pointing. And when you pull back, you fire. And out of your tank's uh, um, turret was coming basically an arrow, (laughs) a flying (laughs) arrow instead of a bullet. And this arrow, if it hit another tank, caused the other tank to spin around with a gear scraping noise Mm -hmm. and and you get points from that or you eventually destroy that tank if you keep firing at it. Maybe maybe the tanks had hit points and you're kind of reducing their hit points. Right, they each had uh, 10 points. Yeah, yeah. So, but if, you're, if your bullet hits um, trees, there were two kinds of trees, you could actually start a forest fire. And so the fire, uh, I had a character graphic for fire that, that would then spread to other trees. So you, could, you can kind of wipe out forests. <laughs> 
there were also tunnels. So one, one character symbol was a kind of ring shape that was a tunnel. If you drive your tank into a tunnel, you may be warped to a different tunnel on the screen and you pop out and can do like a surprise attack on someone else's tank. If you fire into a tunnel, I think your, your bullet could come out another tunnel and hit someone. So there was all this stuff going on. Nice. Yeah. So that may have been the best game that I wrote was a tank. Really dumb name, but but fun game. <laughs> and then next for next was a uh, pushover. Pushover. Yeah. I didn't really like this game. I sort of wrote it. I had an idea for it. I wrote it. I I sort of you know tried to beef it up as well as I could, but. In the end, I thought, eh, it's okay. I submitted it anyway just to see if they would take it. So I thought it wasn't that great a game, but when I visited the Atari computer camps, I happened upon two kids who were playing that game, mm-hmm. and they were going crazy with that game. It was, like, very physical, you know, because the way pushover works is basically it's two people on a cliff trying to push the other person off <laughs> sides of a cliff, and what they're doing is with their joystick, they're trying as fast as possible to match the numbers or letters or arrows that are appearing in the cliff face. Uh, so, like, if an up arrow appears, you have to move your joystick up. Mm-hmm. If the number, f- say, four appears, you have to move your joystick down. If the letter H appears, you have to move it to the upper left, say. So, uh, and you have to do that as fast as possible. Uh, and, you know... Some people like that game, so <laughs> that's great. You know, it be- it became this kind of war of reflexes, and these kids were like sweating and screaming at each other. It was it was great. So it was wonderful to see my game being used by, you know, so- someone aside from my own friends. That's nice. Yeah, get get your stuff actually out there and see it be used by mm. by your the teeming masses. Exactly. All right, so how did you go from doing three games to doing the fourth thing, Fun Fourth? Yeah, I became very interested in fourth. It, it seemed like a cool language. And if I remember, it, it, um, it had an advantage over basic in that it seemed to be faster. Mm-hmm. So I started to develop things in fourth. I ended up writing a game that I never submitted to Atari called Killer Chess, which was a a sort of form of chess where you don't have to take turns. You're just moving pieces to to try to capture the other person and defeat them. Uh, So I was writing that in fourth. And I realized as I was writing stuff in fourth that I was developing functions that others could find useful. So I put all that together into a library of functions and decided to submit that, basically. Hmm. Nice. Do you remember if that sold? That that seemed, my guess is that probably sold about three copies. That would be my guess. <laughs> sold very little. So, all right, aside from the... Those and, four, and by the way, I don't yeah. know the sales figures. Uh, maybe I knew them once, but I really have no idea the sales figures of the other games. If you, if you know those sales figures, it would be interesting to hear them. No, I don't have that. I've seen a lot of... Uh, I haven't seen that data. I, yeah, I bet, to, I bet to, it's out there somewhere. To win, to win the awards, were the awards based on sales? I don't think so. So they were just based on the internal ratings of the of the staff of Apex, as far as I can tell. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that was the last I, thing. You I, said- I, I would guess that a tank sold well, and I think the royalties back that up. Yeah. Yeah, because people like tank battle games. <laughs> <laughs> Well, if your if your mom finds the old royalty statements in a in the shoebox somewhere, you should right. be sure to let me know. Yes. <laughs> Speaking of that, do you do you have any any of the old floppy disks of your unpublished games or anything? You know, they may be in a box somewhere. I I moved years ago from a big house with a big attic to this apartment where we live with very little storage, and I tried to salvage some stuff, but. It was very chaotic in our move. We were just packing things up in, in a mad dash at the end. So I, I don't know what became of that stuff. It, it may have gotten lost in the shuffle. Hmm. If, if it turns up, I'll let you know. Well, I know you have another move coming up. So Yes, it may you, turn up. Yeah, either it'll turn up or you'll never see it again at this point. Yes, yes. But um, yeah, if you find it, 
I would love to uh, pop that into my Atari, and we can move that to an emulator to modern media, and you know, see some of your other the lost works of Joel Clark. Thank you. I think this stuff does exist on emulators. I, I have seen it in the past. Um, you mentioned you've got Babel. I thought I saw a tank or push. Yeah, all, all, I think all four of those things are have been uh, have been digitized. I just yeah. I, I meant the other stuff that your little projects that never got published or oh there there are way too many of those yeah you don't want to see those <laughs> a million little projects nice so why were those the only four things you did for apx god i don't know i was a busy teenager yeah. i was playing playing dungeons and dragons i was in theater productions i was trying to get my schoolwork done i was giving demonstrations in school bringing my computer in <laughs> school i i wrote a titration program for a chemistry class and came in and demonstrated to the class i wrote a spanish language test program and demonstrated in spanish class so i was always like writing these different things and 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 showing them off at school uh, you know, later I was flying to computer camps. Uh, my parents sent me to the University of Iowa one summer to study there, and I was doing programming there on a mainframe. The following summer, I was studying computer science a bit at Cornell for a summer program. So I didn't always have my machines. Mm -hmm. I was like sent away for periods of time. So yeah, all of that, that busyness was getting was getting in the way of writing more games. Yeah, right. I bet. All right, so yeah, I'm curious about the camp thing. Can you remember like how you got that gig and how many camps you went to? And tell me all you can about that. I think I was still in high school. Maybe I was in junior or senior year of high school when I was asked to do that. And it was probably, it was, it was a summertime thing. It, who knows, maybe it was the summer of my senior year. Uh, so between a senior year and college. So... I think I was contacted by someone at APX, I would guess, or maybe they put me in touch with computer camp people. Mm -hmm. But they basically asked if I could visit the computer camps in different parts of the country uh, and give talks and, and sort of demonstrate to the kids what I'm doing. And that's exactly what I did. And I think I actually did it for two summers because I did it that summer and then – the summer after my freshman year at MIT, they asked me to do it a bit again when I was out at uh, Atari Corporate Research and I was staying with Jack. I flew down to San Diego to visit the computer camp there and, and give talks. That was probably my best talk because I actually put together a talk called The Joy of Character Graphics. And I, I came out with wearing a white robe and wearing a very tall plastic garbage bag on my head. So I was kind of posing as the wizard of character graphics. So I, I gave a very theatrical talk. And it sounds silly to us, but the kids loved it. And they, they came up to me for autographs after. They were like totally into it. So it was very fun. I, I, I put together a little kind of the talk. You know, instead of PowerPoint, basically I created my own animated presentation on the Atari. Nice. Nice. Using, <laughs> using character graphics. So, so that was very fun. <laughs> So tell me about the uh, Atari corporate research thing with Jack, how, how you ended up there, what you did. Also, I'm interviewing Jack in about four hours, so what do I need to ask him? <laughs> you were interviewing Jack in four hours. Well, first, say hi for me. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I speak with him once every, like, you know, five years or something. So, we, you know, now and then we talk to each other. He, uh, un unlike me, he really stuck with programming and, and went that route in his life. So he's, he's a professional programmer who has worked for Apple and Microsoft and you know, many companies. So he's, he's an incredible programmer. Um, yeah, so Atari Corporate Research was, was wild to work there. Uh, this was before Atari really crashed as a company. Mm -hmm. So this was when Atari Corporate Research was being headed by Alan Kay, and they still had money. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were just doing all of these really advanced experimental things. So they, they, didn't, they didn't really know what to do with me. So one of the things I was asked to do was to write a kind of graphical simulation of a chip that they were working on, mm -hmm. like a successor to the, to the current graphics chip. So they gave me some specifications and had me kind of do a graphical representation of it. Uh, that's one thing I was working on. I ended up getting uh, another programming language for the Atari that summer called Action, 
yeah. which was a, was was a cartridge. Do you remember Action? I do. It's a great language. Yeah, so I wrote a game in that called very simple game called Gem, where uh, uh, players were playing different characters who were rushing in from corners of the screen to grab a gem and try to escape with it before these different monsters got them. So action was fantastic because the speed of it was just awesome. You could really write high-speed games mm -hmm. in action. So I, I love that. Uh, so I did that that summer. I was being turned on to music that summer because Jack and Landon had uh, really interesting musical tastes. So, for example, the group XTC was very big in their mm -hmm. music collection. Uh, and we were listening to The Police that summer. I think Synchronicity came out that summer. <laughs> Uh, so a lot of interesting stuff was happening. I also had my wisdom teeth taken out, and we did not get the painkillers in time. So my biggest memory from that summer is walking up and down a pharmacy about to kill someone because I was in worse pain than I've ever felt in my life Ooh. as we're waiting for the prescription to be filled for the painkillers. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so it was really interesting summer. Really cool, cool time eating in the cafeteria at... Uh, uh, Atari, they were they were playing the new song from Eurythmics. Sweet dreams are made of this. Was playing in the mm -hmm. cafeteria there. Uh, yeah, so very interesting time meeting lots of cool people. Uh, Doug Crockford was one of the people working there. I don't know if you know who Doug Crock Crockford is. Um, I think yeah, I know who he is. I have not interviewed him yet, but he's on my list. He, oh, you've got interviewed Doug. Uh, I think he wrote. Is it Galahad? He wrote some kind Galahad of adventure. Yeah. yeah, he wrote some kind of adventure game, which was wonderful uh, and very creative. And he went on to become this authority on uh, JavaScript. Hmm. So he's well known in the world of uh, JavaScript uh, for, I think he wrote something called JavaScript, the good parts, and he's given presentations. So he's kind of known for being this very wise, opinionated person on uh, programming. So he was probably my favorite person that I, I met there, aside from uh, Jack and Landon. Nice. Yeah, so that's some of it. It was just unusual for me as this kid who grew up on Long Island to be out on the West Coast. I never really spent time on the West Coast. So to be in Palo Alto and, you know, this like flat, almost desert country <laughs> in Silicon Valley, it was just very unusual. You know, I talked to one other guy uh, a few months ago who was a, uh, an East Coast kid, and he came out to the West Coast to go to Atari computer camps. And the other thing that he mentioned besides the camps was the music, and he liked the how the music was so different. He, you mentioned the Arrhythmics and, and XTC and so forth. It was like the same thing. It was just like it was an entirely different thing. And he was and and he is a musician now, and he does electronica and stuff because basically because that summer he came to the West Coast and heard the music. So. Yeah, music was very big for me that summer because when I visited that computer camp in San Diego, I, I quickly became friendly with the counselors there. They were playing Journey for me, which was a new experience. So I got to hear that, which was very cool. And they took me to a concert. We saw a heart opening for John Cougar. Hmm. And so, so I was exposed <laughs> to a lot of interesting music that summer. <laughs> nice. So I understand that you helped uh, Jack with the gameplay, maybe some levels on Dandy? Yes. I mean, you know, to say help, I, I was a, a little bit consulting him with him with game design and throwing in ideas, but, you know, all the programming was his. I mean, he, he's really an extraordinary programmer. So uh, I can't take any credit for that, but he, I, I may have thrown in an idea or two. All right, where haven't we gone with this conversation that, that we should? We've talked about APX, we've talked about corporate research. I don't know. I mean, who, who listens to these uh, podcasts? What's their interest? Um, it, it really varies. A typical interview will get listened to by a thousand people, and some of them are, want tech stories, and some of them want people stories, and some of them want to hear you know, how, how bad Atari management was. So <laughs> it's, all, yeah. it's, all, it all, it's all different. Yeah, I you know, I was so young at the time, I have no perspective on Atari management. Um, sure. For me, a, Atari Program Exchange was only a wonderful thing. It was kind of like Santa Claus to me. Uh, you know, just these people who were 
uh, so open and accepting of the games I was writing and sending me royalty checks and, and <laughs> selling my games and sending me gifts and prizes. So I was sure. you know, really very happy. Uh, no, com- no complaints. Uh, you know, I, I guess when I, when I reflect on what was going on for me when I was that age and then that I see kids today, I, I will often turn to, you know, teens that I meet and say, so are you learning programming and would you like to learn programming? I've offered to kids uh, who live uh, around my apartment complex, like, would you like me to teach you programming? And yeah, I'm, I'm sort of amazed at at very often the lack of interest or the lack of education and programming that they're getting and um, maybe a feeling that kids are so surrounded by computer games and screens and stuff it's harder for them to get uh, engaged with programming so when I was you know a teenager with a little bit of work I could create something really cool on a computer screen that I had never seen before. Whereas kids today are seeing 3D games and sometimes virtual reality games. For them to create things like that takes more would take more work because you know games now are created by armies of people. Right. Yeah. And now, so, I mean, back then, if you were bored, you needed a new game. You could sit down and program it. And now, if you're bored, you could just go to the app store and click download and you got exactly games. so in a strange way even though programming's more available than it has ever been with open source you know just languages like python mm-hmm. uh, uh sadly the the motivation for kids to learn to program isn't really there and it's i think it's a shame because i think programming uh, really uh, uh, for a couple of reasons one is it's great for the brain just learning that kind of logic, I think, has been fantastic for me in my life, like having that practice of thinking in a very organized way and logical way, how to break down a problem into its logical components. But on the right brain side, the ability to put together something that is interactive and has sound and has visuals and has a story um or or you know uh, uh an, an interactive plot of some kind uh that's just an incredible opportunity which which exists as i say but i think many kids are not are not following through on that because they're sort of saturated by existing entertainments mm-hmm. so as an adult now i'm kind of sad about that 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 there isn't the same environment for kids to follow to get into that as there was when I was a kid I'm sure some kids are doing it there will always be some who are programmers but I I um I'm just I'm very motivated to teach kids what what I know about programming and the interest isn't always there right yeah well someone's got to design the next generation of games so someone some of them are going to have to learn (laughs) that's right what haven't I asked you that I should have Huh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. I guess, you know, one little extra part of the story is that I continued to program at MIT. So I really wasn't doing a lot of my schoolwork. What what I was doing very often was still programming my Atari. And I was writing articles for, I think it's called Antic, the magazine. Um, Yeah, I didn't realize it for Antic. Yeah, so I wrote a, a number of things for Antic that were articles slash programs, and we actually had, I had a column called Our Game, where I was writing a game together with the readers. Hmm. So folks would write in with their ideas, and then, and you know, Antic would send me their letters, and I would incorporate their ideas into the game that we were writing together. Hmm. You, I have a complete database of every antic article and there's nothing by gluck are you sure it was antic Mm, what was the other one analog it may have been analog Hmm. yeah analog sounds familiar give me a second there's an orthodontist called dr gluck and he's messing (laughs) up my searches huh well, neat. I didn't know you do that. So, so what? What was the the game that you wrote collaboratively with the readers? Huh. Now, now you've got me. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it was. I, I, you know, that's a good question. 
um, I'd have to look back and see what we ended up doing. It, it was it was kind of I'm not sure we finished that column. It was kind of mid process. <laughs> Uh, I did publish one or two other games, though, in that magazine. Uh, there was probably one that was uh, a program called Bounce, which was a uh, you basically the the player draws mazes and can set as many balls as they want bouncing through the maze, which was very fun. It was kind of less a game and more of a toy, mm -hmm. a graphical toy. And I think I had another program called Pulse, which creates a very beautiful. Pulsa pulsating colorful image on the screen that's constantly changing. Here we go. Uh, bounce, clues, four-letter words, and more fun with bounce were all in analog computing. Yeah. So clues and four-letter words, I think, may have been the uh, may have been the hour game in the hour game column. Hmm. Would be my guess. Object. Find the hidden treasure as fast as you can. Use joystick number one to move your seeker, the dot, to a point on the grid where you think the treasure might be, and then press the joystick trigger. If you're correct, you win. If not, a clue will appear. Mm. That's what it says about clues. And uh, yeah, some of these, there's no screenshots or anything, so I can't tell you anything about four-letter words. Um, yeah. When I, I was... Um I was starting to experiment. So some of this was when I was at MIT, and then I left MIT to go to theater school. So I went to a two-year conservatory program. I kept programming a little bit during that time, but I was very focused on strange forms of, of human interaction through the computer. I was really into getting people to play with each other through the computer. So I would come up with these games where one person would have to do a behavior on the screen to fool another person. For instance? So I had this, I, I'm trying to think of how the game worked, but, but basically, I, I think the way that it worked was the computer was controlling some figures, some moving creatures on the screen, but one of those creatures was controlled by one of the players, hmm. and the other player had to figure out which was the human one, hmm. as opposed to the simulated ones. <laughs> uh, so you basically had to be good at kind of posing as the computer. That was one of the one of the games. Interesting. Yeah. So I still love writing little graphic demos and games, uh, and do so on airplanes as I'm flying around the world doing leadership training. <laughs> but, but these days I'm writing it in Python, and if I'm trying to do something really quick and dirty, Python has a built-in Turtle graphics package. So it's very easy using that to do very little, you know, little things with graphics and just little experiments. So that's how that's how I get my kicks when I just um, want to put my work work aside and do something fun. That's cool. Do you have a, a website or anything where you share this stuff? Or I don't. I have two small kids, so I share it with them. Hmm. And I've taught my daughter some Python and some Logo. Uh, Start her on Logo with the Turtle Graphics, and then I realized that Python had a great Turtle Graphics package built right in. Yeah. Uh, and we've also done some Scratch together. Oh, that's fun. Yeah. Nice. And uh, she's a little interested, but my son, who is three, he, you know, you never know. He may be more interested. <laughs> how, how old's your daughter? She is seven. Hmm. Yeah. Good. So um, I'm not. I'm trying not to push it, but let them sort of request it. Uh, you know, I, I don't want them to be in a position where it's like my dad made me program. <laughs> <laughs> My dad forced me to learn something useful. Exactly, yeah. Um, if you could send a message to the Atari people who used your programs back in the day and are listening to this now, what would you tell them? Like who, the people who played my games? Yeah, and now they're listening to this. Send huh. a message. Well, I, I, I guess I would, uh, I would be very happy that they played my games, Really, practically, I would love it if they would write to me and, and tell me <laughs> their experience of using those games. If they have any memory of it, it would be very, very fun to hear from them. Awesome. How do they contact you? Do you have a Twitter or Facebook? or? Uh, very, very, very primitive. Just my email address. It's joelgluck at yahoo.com. All right. Awesome. I think I have what I need. Great. Kevin, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, Joel. This has been great. All right. You have a you have a good weekend. You too. Bye. Take care. Bye bye.
If you enjoyed these interviews and would like to contribute something, I encourage you instead to donate to one of our favorite organizations, the Internet Archive, at archive.org. The Internet Archive is a nonprofit digital library with the stated mission of universal access to all knowledge. They've done incredible things to preserve computer history, including hosting thousands of programs in an in-browser Atari emulator, creating the Wayback Machine, and offering full-page scans of countless Atari computer books and magazines. Make your tax-deductible contribution at archive.org donate.